what stands in the way of efficient vaccine distribution? Talk of my discussion today with Cheryl Drool. She is Associate Professor of Operations Management at George Mason University's School of Business. Hello, Cheryl. Hello, thank you for having me today. So why haven't states received the promised number of doses of the COVID-19 vaccine that they were promised in a timely manner? Well, that's a good question. I'm sure the states would like to know the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, supply chains aren't as easy to ramp up as we would like. Uh, manufacturing and distribution are both complicated. I think in this case, manufacturing of the vaccine itself is not straightforward. We have multiple parties doing the manufacturing, but in addition, the cold chain requirements of the distribution, trucker shortages, um, you know, logistics in general have re you know, resulted in some difficulties as well. Sounds like everything is possibly, it could possibly go wrong. There's no particular part of the supply chain where disruptions are especially a problem. No, I don't think there's been something specific. I think overall, uh, I think it's just harder to ramp up than we would like. The question of scale being probably number one, right? Yes, I mean, yes. I mean, this is the largest mass vaccine that the United States and certainly the world has ever tried to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think everyone is doing a pretty good job. The fact that we got the vaccine developed <laughs> in the first place is quite a, um, a miracle. Yeah. And I think as we move forward, things are starting to improve. Supply chains are speeding up. Um, the vaccine numbers are speeding up, which I think is terrific. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose we should be grateful that the vaccine is being manufactured by multiple manufacturers. Number one, that gives us more doses. Number two, gives us more variety and spread. But does that also not lead to other problems? If you're sourcing from so many different manufacturers, does that not add to the complexity as well? Yes, that certainly adds to the complexity. I think in this case, uh, we only have two major just, uh, you know, vaccine manufacturers at the moment, although they're working with various partners. But mm -hmm. I think from a redundancy perspective, that's a good thing. We wouldn't want to have a sole supplier of a vaccine, if at all possible. Yeah, well, it, has, it hasn't been the case in the past. Even, even with vaccine distributions at a smaller scale, have they not always been, they've come from multiple manufacturers before, right? I think so. I think, you know, yeah. there may be some that are, you know, um, specialized to a sing single firm. But I think in general, the idea is to get as much redundancy in the system as possible so we have mm -hmm. the safe healthcare that we need. Still, it seems odd. I mean, again, on this issue of scale, we've, we've faced nothing of this size for 100 years or so. But there was no, we've had other vaccines, we've had other pandemics, there was no playbook lying around that someone could pick up and say, yeah, I know this is bigger than ever before. But here are some of the techniques and some of the things we can use based on past experience to make this work better. It doesn't sound like anybody had anything like that on hand. I think that there may have been some uh, playbooks for the pandemics or in the World Health Organization, but I think mostly the focus was really on getting the vaccines developed um, and then getting, I think, some degree the, the doses ordered, but not so much on the nitty gritty supply chain issues, which, mm -hmm. you know, as you rightly point out, are complicated and it would be good to have a playbook for. Yeah, these initial, um, I think, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, say, I think clearly people realize that now supply chain has become much more important and more visible than ever before. And I think people are really starting to realize that um, they do need to think about these nitty gritty, not so exciting, but clearly very critical issues. Oh, I think everybody's pretty excited <laughs> about one way or or another. Now, these initial uh, vaccines that it, it first came out, uh, you know, obviously required substantial refrigeration at super cold temperatures. And that was indicated as being one of the biggest challenges that distributors are going to face. Has that indeed turned out to be a major challenge? Or I, I, from what I hear, you hear one or two instances of the, of the vaccine being subject to spoilage, and they had to very quickly administer it to people. But has that proved to be a big challenge? Um, it doesn't seem to have been a big challenge. I think that between dry ice and the, and the freezers, they were able to manage it. They built mm -hmm. the special containers. I think um, a lot of that vaccine went to hospitals, right, that had the, right. the right kind of storage. And I think as we try to scale up the vaccine to other distribution channels, it's going to be harder because that they will not have those kinds of refrigerators at least in the short term until, again, we can scale up that kind of uh, manufacturing and supply those mm -hmm. kind of refrigerators. Or is, there a, is there enough dry ice in, in, in the pipeline? 
Uh, I think that people have been challenged to get the amount of dry ice as well. Um, it, it certainly hasn't been something that has been in favor. People aren't using a lot of dry ice, generally speaking. And so they yeah. had to ramp up dry ice production as well. What about on the transportation and logistics side? I understand that UPS and FedEx are going to are big players in the delivery of this. Do they have enough capability and infrastructure in order to handle this on top of their usual business? So that's a good question. I think I think um, certainly they have enough cap enough capacity to handle this. I think Amazon is stepping in, UPS, FedEx, DHL, some of the others. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, is with the increase in all of the other online shopping and logistics right. activity going on. Um, but I think the question is, is what are the priorities? And I think consumers with all of the supply chain issues have become more accustomed to things not getting to them, um, particularly on time. Two day mm -hmm. shipping isn't always two day shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think people I, would be happy to have the priority of the shipping go to the vaccines as opposed to th their other items. You would, you um, would think so, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's gonna be a question of how they prioritize their capacity, um, but I think they can do it. And I also think that they have a fairly good um, and reactive logistics network which they can effectively use, they're able to um, change plans rapidly in terms of, you know, they realize that they get an order of vaccines on, you know, this Monday from the government to send to somewhere and they can probably quickly turn around their plans to make that happen. But there's only so much capability in the delivery system for all types of e-commerce. Have regular products suffered in terms of how long it takes for them to get to the customer and whether they can indeed be handled by these, by these uh, parcel carriers at all, given the fact that they are very much involved in the vaccine distribution? Has the rest of the uh, e-commerce supply chain suffered? Um, I have not seen any evidence of it, no. Yeah. So, yeah. So, no, I mean, heard, yeah, nor have I, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a great sign, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm hoping that is not a big logistical challenge. Yeah. Do we have the labor? Do we have the people? Uh, these are, I don't know if you consider these to be frontline workers or not, but the drivers, the warehouse workers, the distributors, seems to me that that would be a, a huge effort getting that many people on board. So I think I, I would personally call them frontline workers. Yeah. I think the, with all of the increase in e-commerce and grocery delivery and the fact that people don't want to shop and we don't really necessarily have wanted them to go out and shop, mm -hmm. that all of these kind of logistical workers really are essential workers. Um, and so are, are there shortages? Um, there certainly were early on. I think more people have been trained. I think as we've improved safety measures, then the, the workers have hopefully been falling sick less often. Um, and hopefully they are also going to be in line for the vaccine um, early on as essential workers. Yeah. And so I think that will help. But there's historically been a shortage of long haul truck drivers. And so that in, is still a concern. And, um, you know, I think, uh, as I mentioned, supply chain isn't seen as the most exciting thing for many people. And that includes the people who are working in the supply chain often. It's hard to attract new labor. Mm -hmm. And yet it's really critical for our nation in this time, but in general as well. And yet it just seems anecdotally that there's still so much confusion at the local level as to who has how many doses. People rumored like you can go to this place to get vaccinated and this place doesn't have it, and this place doesn't have enough. There's just so much out there that is unanswered. I mean, we're, I guess we're going to be grappling with that for some time to come, right? Yeah, so I see that in my neighborhood listservs, certainly. Um, yeah. How to get on the list, where to get vaccines, uh, clearly a lot of consumer confusion. Uh, I think some states have done it better than others. Clearly it's, it's done state by state and even county by county. Um, and I'm hoping we're not gonna have to grapple with this for a long time as, as things are hopefully are starting to improve and states figure out slightly better ways to communicate. The transparency is clearly a key part of making any supply chain work efficiently. And so getting consumers access to the right data in terms of when to sign up, how to sign up, where they can even go to do that sign up um, is a pretty critical part of making the supply chain work. You know, Cheryl, we're so good at hindsight. Uh, so let's employ <laughs> our powers now in that area and say, what could have been done better? So I think coordination between the states and the federal governments, 
Um, clearly, what it could have been better. I think, as we said early on in this, the um, getting the vaccines developed was important, but also the planning of how to roll them out to you know people getting vaccinated was also important. And I think mm -hmm. better coordination could have been done there. Um, I think the other thing that could be done better was the was we just said the sign up systems for consumers. I think there's a lot of consumer confusion. People are clamoring for the vaccines because they do want them. There is a shortage, which generally means things are more are um, more desired, right? Because there is a shortage. Uh, so having that better information systems would be useful. And even the this, this transparencies between the federal government's doses and the state's doses would be useful. Do you think we've learned some valuable lessons? Do you think we'll be better the next time because of what happened this time? Absolutely, I think so. I mm -hmm. think we're already learning as we go. We have um, you know, more doses out of the same vial. So there's been innovation. We're learning how to better manage our vaccine sites. Um, we called in experts from managing lines, which is critical here. Uh, and I think that um, people will not forget I think, I think hopefully the, the lessons learned will be captured. So maybe not the best report card as to our performance this time around, but certainly some hope that we'll do better next time. And uh, Cheryl Drool, thank you so much for kind of shining a light on what some of the difficulties have been this time around and helping us to understand how we might do a better job next time. Thanks a lot for being with me. Really appreciate it. Thank you.